There are so many men of letters, women of letters, prominent people who have looked at the evidence of 9-11 and concluded scientifically, politically, historically, that the attacks of 9-11 could only be a self-inflicted wound and inside job. And Professor Stephen Jones is one of the shining lights in this fight to expose government-sponsored terror that's being used to turn our planet into a prison planet. Professor Jones, of course, has written and published in some of the most prestigious scientific peer-reviewed publications in the country. He has engaged in research projects studying different scientific developments for the federal government. He is a doctor of physics from Brigham Young University, and he is trained and taught at many other prestigious institutions around the country. And I would hope tonight he would get a little bit into how he woke up, the evidence of the fact that it's impossible to bring down those towers with simple uh, jet fuel, and then his research of the thermite, thermate. Uh, this is one of the most important developments in the last four years, almost five years, in the fight to expose 9-11. So please welcome him with a warm round of applause. Stand up for him. Took a lot of courage to do what he did. Professor Stephen Jones, Doctor of Physics and Archaeometry, joins us right now for the keynote address. Dr. Jones. Uh, my wife. Uh, said this evening as we were having a quick bite to eat, <laughs> I hope you had a bite to eat, she said, you know, Alex reminds me of Patrick Henry. She said, she said, them's fighting words. Them's fighting words. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Okay, so uh, let's see, is, uh, there we go, great. That's always a relief to see that the slides are gonna work. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, I'll present, present some uh, answers to objections and questions. I will talk about thermite and thermate as we go along. And um, I decided to take this approach. You know, as I meet people, I get lots of questions. And I thought, well, how about if I answer some of these questions that I get all the time? Okay, the first one is, where is your famous, or some say infamous, uh, paper published? I just am curious. Uh, how many, and there's the address, or you can Google on, you know, if you Google on Jones Thermite, the first thing that comes up is Alex Jones Thermite. <laughs> and I think my paper is second, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, you'll see. <laughs> uh, just a question, how many of you have uh, had a chance to look at this paper? I just wonder here. Okay, good. Okay, but not everybody. So there's a chance for you to, uh, to read that. It's in Espanol and Japanese, and uh, I think Finnish too right now, but I'm not sure where the Finnish website is. Okay, <clears throat> I'd like to announce tonight uh, the Journal of 9-11 Studies. This now will contain other scholarly um, papers. <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> I'm very pleased about this. It's just uh, been on, online since uh, Thursday evening, about 11 o'clock at night. We finally got it online. And I will be quoting from some of the papers. And uh, so as we go along, I, I'm very pleased about this. Uh, other academics are also providing papers. And this will, and it does, contain now five already peer-reviewed papers. And we'll talk about the importance of peer review as we go along, what that means how it helps us to sort out fact from fiction. It's, a, it's part of this modern scientific method, really. <clears throat> so a question, how did I get started <clears throat> in my 9-11 studies? Um, I had various nudges over the past several years. Had a friend, uh, Steve Crowley, kept saying, you gotta study this, and uh, uh, wow. other friends. I didn't really do too much until I went with my wife, she <clears throat> took me to a lecture by Sarah Manet in Utah. There are about 300 people at this lecture, and Sarah was talking about various things, and she said, if you think those buildings came down on 9-11 just because of a few hijackers hitting the towers, you have major surprises ahead of you. <laughs> and I thought, and the audience just burst into applause at that, you know, when she said that, and I'm, I didn't, I just was sitting there, well, 
what is she talking about? I don't know what is going on. But you know, you can give nudges. And you think, you, you have a badge on. I see you've got one, Bob. And that's good. And, but if you have a badge that reflects 9-11, oh, dang, I forgot my badge. I should, here I am saying that. But anyway, sorry. But uh, so a little something, bumper sticker, uh, something that gives people nudges. You'd be surprised. You get a few nudges, and then someone looks at it and uh, looks into it. Maybe they'll go to ST911, which are, is our scholars for 911 Truth site that Jim Fetzer uh, and I co-chair now. Jim was really the founder, and uh, I'm co-chair with that. But anyway, if they get onto a good site, uh, then pretty quick they, they'll be able to find out for themselves. And that's really what I did. I went to WTC7.net, and uh, I saw the collapse of Building 7 for the first time. And that is what did it for me initially. You know, here it is. <laughs> On the left is Building 7, and on the right is a demolition of a building in Oslo, which uh, looks almost identical. And both of them collapse at near free fall speed, but just a little less. Here we go. Okay, we'll go on a little bit. I want to just talk a little about Building seven. Now I have quite a few slides. As I was putting this together, and, and I put quite a few in, and some of these I'm going to go over fast. So I apologize, but uh, like uh, Webster Tarpley, you know, I perceive that I've got to cover a little more than I really <laughs> expect you to uh, be patient to see. I have 140 slides. I think <laughs> I prepared tonight. It's too many. So here we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, we'll see what we can do. Building 7 on the afternoon of 9-11 is shown in the right picture, uh, looking from the old uh, World Trade Center area there. You can see nothing left but debris. But Building 7 stands 47 stories tall. Uh, it was about 300 feet away from the North Tower, uh, WTC-1. And uh, there were some fires in the building, but you can see it's not a raging inferno over there by any means. Uh, here, uh, uh, the picture mark C is uh, the building as it looked before 9-11, just to give you an idea of the immensity of this structure. Very solidly built, never hit by a jet, of course. And then after the collapse, it's a nice, neat pile. And it's quite remarkable, actually, to, to get such a nice, uh, what we call an implosion, bringing that building onto its own footprint. And as I studied this, I learned about the 9-11 Truth Movement, which is large and growing. This photo was one of the better ones I've seen regarding our movement, and it was in the New York Times just after the Chicago meeting. So, you know, we're getting some publicity that's mixed, but anyway, it's coming. Okay, here's the first paper in the new Journal of 9-11 Studies, and it has to do with uh, World Trade Center 7. It's a computation on the free fall by uh, Professor Kenneth Cutler, professor of mathematics at my university. So, you know, we've become friends. <laughs> but he did this on his own. I had no idea Ken was working on this uh, calculation. Here's the equation that he derives. Uh, we'll spend some time explaining that. No, no. <laughs> I won't bother you. <laughs> okay, no. Um, this is the equation. This is a very serious uh, paper. It's short and terse. When you look at it, you'll see uh, Ken doesn't uh, waste a lot of words. He uses equations and uh, comes to some conclusions. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me go back to his uh, introduction, actually, which talks about the conclusions. A short computation, he says, focused on building seven, favorable assumptions for achieving a fast fall including ignoring resistance due to intact steel columns, you see, so that's ignoring a lot. He still could only get the uh, building to fall in about 8.3 seconds, whereas the observed roofed roof fall time, this is a corner of the roof that he's looking at, 6.5 seconds. So, and he uses conservation momentum and, and uh, pursues the uh, collapse that way. It, when, when one floor hits another, 
the first floor is slowed down because the, the floor it hits is stationary. Just like when you bump into a car, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't wish this, but it all happens to most of us. You slow down when you hit that, so the same thing. And uh, you, you just calculate using conservation momentum, and it takes longer than what the building required. So his point is that something had to move these floors below out of the way so that this building could fall that fast. And he goes through the calculation. And in a footnote, his paper says, any further analysis of the collapse of Building 7 should include all floors, not just floors 8 to 46, and conservation momentum considerations. Both of those have to be included, you see. Now, why would he, uh, and there's a little footnote here. Does anybody know why he says you have to include all the floors, not just floors 8 to 46? Why, why does the paper? Yeah, Rilla. Uh, that's, the only, that's all you can see because of the foreground, right? Well, no, there's more to it than that. He says that's all you can see because of the foreground. Okay, let me show you what it says in this reference. If you look it up, NIST, National Institute of Sector, uh, Standards and Technology, had decoupled their study of Building 7 from the study of the towers. Now, their report on Building 7 is not out. It's been delayed and delayed, and they finally contracted with ARA, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's ARA in Albuquerque, to analyze the collapse of Building 7. And here is what they said, that they, this uh, subcontract uh, to ARA would have them do. Create detailed floor analyses to determine determine likely modes of failure for floors 8 to 46 due to failure of one or more supporting columns. Now, look, folks, this, this building is 47 stories. Why did they say, we only want you to analyze floors 8 to 46? <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure, but you know, I mean, in Cutler's paper, he says, look, I considered all the floors. If you're going to do a decent job, you have to consider all the floors. I have a guess why they didn't consider the lower floors. Because there is some funny business going on. They also, NIST won't, won't uh, so far release to us the photos or any uh, videos that they have regarding Building 7. And I believe that if they did, we'd find some evidence of some real funny business. But now, with this publication, you see what this does. It says, OK, we've studied it. When you analyze it, you now have to consider this because it's a published paper. It's been peer reviewed. And in your analysis, ARA, you have to consider these factors. If you don't, we're watching, you know, that this is not good science. If you, and furthermore, this business already of limiting, you know, it's putting blinders on. Don't look at anything but floors 8 to 46. <laughs> I'm just appalled that they would, NIST would, would provide such an unscientific restriction. Come on, people, we got to look at all the data and not just floors 8 to 46, okay? <laughs> That's amazing. It's just remarkable, uh, you know, from a scientific point of view, they do that, but they did. Okay, if a collapse is started, what happens next? You ever think about that? So let's say, let's grant somehow the tower starts to collapse. What happens next? There's a paper in the journal, 9-11 Studies, that considers this question. Uh, ana analysis by Gordon Ross, who has uh, degrees in mechanical engineering and manufacturing engineering. The analysis shows that, this is in his conclusion, that despite the assumptions made in favor of collapse continuation, vertical movement of the falling section, this is the portion above where the planes hit, uh, would be arrested prior to completion of the 3% shortening phase of the impacted columns. And again, he's got the equations, the data to back all this up. A collapse driven only by gravity would not continue to progress beyond that point. Now what he's saying, this mechanical engineer, is that, wait a minute folks, we got it, you know, it's not just enough to get it to start collapsing, you have to see what happens next. Now what does NIST say. <clears throat> in their um, report, which they put out, was last October, as I recall, September or October, NIST said uh, their report on the towers. 
The focus of the investigation was on the sequence of events from the instant of aircraft impact to the initiation of the collapse of each tower. For brevity, this sequence is referred to as the probable collapse sequence, although it does not actually include the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for collapse initiation were reached. In other words, we only take it to the point where things get started. No more. Again, the old blinders are on. On page 142, they express the same thing. Uh, their computer simulation, which they resorted to because their models, you know, let me back up a second. The NIST actually uh, contracted with underwriter laboratories to build uh, models of the World Trade Center floor trusses and test them, the floor assemblies, and uh, subject them to severe fire tests. What happened? They did not fail. Now there was some warping. It didn't fail. You know, the building wouldn't even start to collapse according to the fire test. Those are actual experiments, which I, I like. That was a good thing to do, but the buildings didn't collapse, you see. But now, now, so then they went to computer simulations and they got things to fail. But only to the point where it starts to collapse. Excuse me. What happens after that? You know, I'm a scientist. I want to know, you know, does this thing keep going or does it stop? <clears throat> NIST. The results were a simulation, again, they resorted to that, of the structural deterioration of each tower from the time of the aircraft impact to the time at which the building became unstable, i.e., was poised for collapse. Now, uh, what uh, Gordon Ross here is saying, the mechanical engineer, is saying, look, We'll take it the next step. We'll see. And he uses conservation momentum and conservation of energy. These are laws of physics, the fundamental laws of science now, uh, conserving energy and uh, momentum. And he says, here's what happens when you look at all the energy losses and everything. It drops, and it, then it just stops. It's, it's like, I, was think, I woke up this morning thinking about this paper, <laughs> OK? I don't know. And, uh, but I, I, there's an analogy that came to me, because it's in his, it isn't, this particular analogy isn't there, but the math is there. So what, if you think of the towers as uh, the, the 240 perimeter columns as a big spring, because see what he's saying is it flexes, when you hit it, it flexes, that's like a spring, okay? Yeah, there's some give to it. And, then, and in the center of the tower, there's another spring, 47 support columns up the center. So what you've got is nested springs, and when you drop a block, and I, I, you know, if I had a chance to go to a store to buy some big springs, I would. <laughs> okay, big spring, a small spring in the center, that's your model. You drop a block on it, what happens? Well, it just disintegrates. No, it doesn't just disintegrate, you know. It, it, it gives, it gives, and that's his point, it gives. I mean, I suppose it's possible it could, but as he goes through the math, it doesn't disintegrate. It gives, and then that's it. The collapse does not continue. Amazing paper. I hope that he'll be here and uh, give me a break, you know. I'll listen to Gordon talk and explain it a little more. So we call the NIST final report, this is a forum we have in our scholars group, uh, the official pre-collapse theory because it doesn't really talk about the collapse. It's only pre-collapse, you see. So this is the pre-collapse theory. And Gordon Ross has given us the official theory now the rest of the way, it just doesn't proceed. Isn't that interesting? I thought that was a fantastic paper, and I hope you'll read it. Now, a little bit on demolition. I decided at the last minute to pull up these slides, which I used last uh, September when I first spoke about this subject at BYU. And <laughs> And if you look at the building on the right, you see the jets or plumes of gas and debris coming off the side. And we call these squibs. Uh, that's how the terminology we use a lot. But. And you see the squibs, and others have pointed this out earlier today, so I won't spend much time on that. <clears throat> Let's see, do I have a pointer? 
you can see the squibs though, can't you? Here's one, you can see that one real clearly. And notice this one, they tend to be in the center of the building or maybe stretched across the center some, but uh, my pointer's gone somewhere, there we go. Anyway, this one's right in the center. This is an interesting one, very uh, obviously high energy and it, you see the debris it's carrying with it, you see that? I can't keep my pointer going, but in the squib you see some debris carried with that. Oh, I'll talk more about super thermite uh, as we go on. Now, see, so I don't want to read all of this, but the green, mm, let's read some of this. Sometimes, though, a building is surrounded by structures that must be preserved. In this case, the blasters proce proceed with a true implosion, demolishing the building so that it collapses straight down into its own footprint. Now, this is not easier. It's much easier to put explosives and have the building topple over. <clears throat> a law of probability. And that's what I mean when I say the law of increasing entropy. I've been in question about that. What I'm talking about is the probabilities here. I'm using it in the broad sense of this law. That is, there's much more opportunities for uh, the final state to be toppled over than just straight down. There's only one of those and there's a lot of uh, others, you see. So, that's what I mean. <clears throat> This feat of bringing a building straight down onto its own footprint requires such skill that only a handful of demolition com companies in the world will attempt it. Well, what the heck, just put a few random fires in there, maybe some damage, and, and you saw the towers, they just fall straight down. I mean, what's all this? What, <laughs> you know, I <laughs> see what I'm saying? What's all this, right? <laughs> okay. And you better patent that one real quick before somebody else thinks about it. You know, just some random fires in the building. Hey, it'll come straight down. It's great. You know, quit paying these companies all this money. Okay. No, seriously, when you demolish a building, uh, you, and this is the point. You see, look at the picture there. You can read if you want, but I'm not going to spend too much time. But the point is important that the um, way the blasters generally proceed is first and second blasts are way down low. You, you pull out the supports. Pull is the turn. <laughs> you pull the supports on these columns. Remember, these huge columns are supporting this building. Well, you've got to, you've got to weaken the building. And sometimes they do pre-cutting, actually. They go in and cut the supports, weaken things before. Or you can do it, as it says here, with blasts, which I think uh, there's, well, Willie uh, Rodriguez, right? He was down in the sub-basement area of the tower. Was that the North Tower? And uh, he hears this huge explosion just before the plane hit, he reported, okay? Now what, why would you do that? Well, you, you want to weaken the building down low, you see? Now, the official theory is that all the weakening due to planes, uh, a plane in each tower and then fires, all of that was in the upper levels. Huh? So again, it won't work, I mean. Okay, so let's see if I, okay, let's look at some. Squibs, very rapid fall. And now you know what's going on. They're, uh, they're destroying the, the lower, the, the internal columns way down first. And, and that's consistent totally with what uh, uh, Willie Rodriguez, Rodriguez reported, yeah? his observation. And he said, I asked him, uh, did you hear uh, of other explosions? Yes, and others reported too, around floors eight, and so on. So that's just what you expect. You gotta, you gotta cut those lower columns. Now here's another way then to do controlled demolition if the official theory is correct. I mean, you know, the planes hit up high, uh, floor 80 for the South Tower, and floor uh, gosh, was it 90 something for the North Tower. So think of it, all you have to do is put a few explosions in the upper floors, don't worry about the sub-basement columns, and set off the explosions, do it randomly, because after all the fires and the jets, that was just random damage. Just set a few off randomly on the upper floors, and be, lo and behold, watch that building come crashing straight down. And no, it won't work. Of course, Gordon Ross uh, directly approached that. But you know, this, can you see how it's really quite I mean, it's just such a stretch. <laughs> now, I, I actually interview the, what the official story is. It's just a stretch. And I'm glad to see people like Gordon Ross saying, okay, 
it's kind of crazy what you're saying, but I'm going to go through and look at conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, the fundamental, fundamental bedrock laws of physics, and we will see what happens if you start, I'll give it to you, let that whole block just start all at once somehow, just as a whole block, nothing in the way, collapse down, what happens? And what happens is the other columns below are cold. You know, there's not all this fire down below. <laughs> well, they're strong and they give. Yeah, it's like a spring. It's, not, it's a real stiff spring, but they give. And, and they're interconnected and it's like a tree, you know, it gives. In fact, it's designed to give against winds and it's like a, uh, a tree, as uh, the way uh, Professor Wood puts it. Judy Wood, she's the co-editor with me on this new journal. And she's at Clemson University, a mechanical engineer. Anyway, it's a, it's a structure that it, those internal columns give, okay? So again, the spring analogy. Okay, so I just thought a little humor would help here. <laughs> you know, this guy's got these equations and the result, and then in the middle he's got a miracle occurs, you know? Well, <laughs> okay. Well, you know, that's kind of... Uh, the official story, you know, well, we, we saw the fires and we saw the collapse, so obviously there's, we don't know what happened in between, but, you know, a miracle occurred. It takes science to sort that out. Okay. <clears throat> Someone mentioned, in fact, it was Jim Fetzer, my uh, co-chair there on the scholars group. He mentioned this 9-11 uh, myth. Let me see. How many of you have visited that site? Anybody? There's just a few. Okay. <laughs> But uh, they, they basically espouse the, uh, the official story, finally, if, as you read it. And uh, there's an example down there in red, so you can see um, Silverstein lost money, and is what they claim in this site. Somehow he lost money even though he got a $4.6 billion settlement. Now this again is a stretch, <laughs> no. But they promote <clears throat> that sort of argument. It's kind of like a continuation, uh, this site is a continuation of the popular mechanics um, type of our, 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 you know, argument, right? Just a lot of, well, let's read what uh, Rick Ratcher, he's at MIT, says about this. I will focus on the, this is a preview, it's not published yet. I will focus on the methodology of the arguments put forth in 911myths.com, give the top 10 examples of half-truths, false information, speculation, but no substance. And so he'll write an article on the art of discernment. This is something we all need to learn. Take down the key and critical arguments that collapses the entire deck of cards. So, just to give you an idea of what uh, sort of uh, things we're doing in this journal. We do take critiques seriously, and he will be answering those. Question arises, what else do I do besides 9-11? Not much lately. Um, although uh, we did get a house, my wife and I did get a house in the country, which we kind of like, we're trying to get a little more self-sufficient, you know, independent. So. <laughs> okay, so, but here's the thing, now, uh, Ye Samaki visited me and I gave him, a, he, he and his uh, companion there, both from Mali, Africa, gave them some of our solar cookers, which I invented about 1998. You see the parabola there, and I discussed this more in Chicago. Uh, here's some data. I, I, um, I mentioned this partly because, just to show you what else I do, partly, uh, but also to say I've worked in the energy field, uh, with solar and uh, fusion energy, doing research in those two areas for essentially all my career. When I started at BYU, I was thick into what's called muon catalyzed fusion and um, the other fact is we may need these type of cookers as you know as I was listening to Alex talk tonight there's also you can write that down if you want the solarcooking.org a good group anybody well hopefully uh, are there any solar cookers out there I've cooked a lot of meals with this anybody else by any chance okay yes Girl Scouts, Girl Scouts all right <laughs> did you use a box cooker Okay, but this funnel cooker is much faster. Box cooker will cook food, it works, it's uh, gosh, about 120 or at least years ago that was a box. You let the sun in through a window on the top. It's well insulated. 
and it takes uh, three or four hours typically to cook food in the, those things. The solar funnel cooker will cook food in about an hour and a half, except beans, and even those, if you soak them overnight, an hour and a half, <laughs> okay, as you can see. And on the right, uh, there's, uh, and also lower left, <coughs> a cooker that uses charcoal briquettes, so on rainy days you have a backup. Now here's what I was thinking as I was listening to Alex talk. And we'll talk about the dust, I'll go over it kind of quickly though tonight because of, you know, we're all getting probably a little tired, some are hungry, and <laughs> my wife got me a treat, so I'm not real hungry, fortunately. But uh, I know some of you are. But anyway, the point is, I had to agree with Alex, the, it's clear from this dust episode, this highly toxic dust and the thousands that are sick, many are dying. And some have already died because of this toxic World Trade Center dust. Okay, the point is our leaders seem willing to lie to us and to our hurt. Now this is not a pleasant situation. And it occurred to me as he was talking, what would they do? We take for granted our infrastructure, electricity, water, transportation. What if they cut, just an example, what if to, you know, to get us to buckle under, for example, I don't know, they don't like us, made them mad somehow. But if they cut off the grid, <clears throat> cut the power, bing, it's gone. I don't have my flashlight with me, so I'm, we're all stuck, but we could probably make our way out. Now, <clears throat> when the power is off, you can't, it's very difficult to cook food. We have electric stoves, but even if you have a gas stove, <clears throat> well, a gas stove actually you probably could because you, you could light it with a match. But how about your furnace? That has a thermostat. It's not gonna work too, it won't work without electricity. So we get stuck in a hurry. Well, you can take care of heat with warm clothing. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sorry, I just don't think that we can take for granted that our grid is going to last. <clears throat> it's actually quite fragile. Are you, I, I don't know, in Southern California, if you, are you still having the rolling blackout thing? No? It's gone. They fixed it. <laughs> Enron did that to you. Okay, well, they didn't like you. I guess. But anyway, the point is, it could happen again, as much as we hate to admit it. And uh, <clears throat> the solar cooker is one way to prepare so you can cook food. You're independent of the grid. You don't have to be afraid of them saying, yeah, we got your grid cut off, but you know, we blame it on Iran. And you know, I said, wait a minute. I don't need <laughs> the grid because I've made some preparations. Okay, okay so we, we share values. And I, I noticed Alex talking about this too. We share values of truth, caring for others. We care about long-term concerns. We love our country, our constitution. These are values that prepare us in this, uh, in this struggle in which we're engaged. And that's, these are my motivations here. Okay, this is the next question. Doesn't your work on cold fusion discredit you? I'll let you be the judge. Published a paper in Scientific American with Professor Johann Rafelski, a good friend of mine, who is Jewish, by the way, a very good friend of mine, in July of 87, so it goes back a ways, and notice the title of our article, Cold Nuclear Fusion. Now this is talking about muon-catalyzed fusion, which I won't go into in detail, but it really works. There's no question about it. We achieve the record that still stands today, 150, plus or minus 20, fusions per muon. And this is a single, it's an elementary particle, and during its lifetime we get 150 fusions, which is, uh, which is quite good. That's about 3,000 uh, um, MeV of energy released, so, yeah. Okay, in April of 1989, we published a paper, notice Rafelski is with us again, and colleagues at BYU on a different type of cold fusion, but it's still, you see cold fusion just simply means fusion at room temperature. So the sun has hydrogen in it, huh? And the centers of the atoms, the nuclei, come together and stick, that's fusion. Energy's released. 
And of course the sun, that's hot fusion. And we're talking about fusion at room temperature or below actually, but approximately room temperature. Our, our record was achieved in liquid uh, deuterium, tritium, those are forms of hydrogen, but anyway, in liquid, so it was at about 21 Kelvin. It was very cold. <laughs> but that's where we had the record number of fusions with muon catalyzed. Now here we're talking about fusion in metals and fusion in the earth. And so it's published in a peer-reviewed article. Of course, this is Nature. It's uh, one of the most prestigious uh, along with uh, Scientific American uh, publications in the world. And it was peer reviewed for reviewers. I assure you, this was not an easy thing to get this paper published. <laughs> it was published. And uh, nine years later, we have Kasagi, and then uh, shortly after, uh, Zersky, confirming finally our results with 100% reproducibility, which is one of the touchstones of good science. You be, have to be able to do it every time. Mm -hmm. And um, gosh, that makes me think about the towers. You know, there's so many examples of fire and damage in buildings where they didn't collapse. In fact, all except on 9/11. <laughs> and so, where's the repeatability for these guys? You know, I mean, if if fire We'll bring a building down. Why didn't it happen at the L.A. Bank building, you know? And, uh, well, the tower itself, uh, one of the towers that was, had a tremendous fire, and the Madrid building, and the building in Caracas, and so on, you know? The, these huge structures with fires, they never collapse totally. Now, there's partial, of course, collapse. That's different. But I'm talking about total, straight-down collapse, huh? That's only three World Trade Center buildings. <laughs> Repeatability, okay? Thank you. Okay. So those who are interested in coal or metal catalyzed fusion, which is not all of you, probably taking a chance to read that, so I'll go on. But just to say, the method here, what, what finally, see in science generally, you, you do experiments and finally you get something that's a breakthrough. You, you nail it. Uh, we say the, the, the question mark is, is gone. Uh, on metal catalyzed fusion. It really works, and here's a little more data. I mean, we expect uh, the materials on the right, uh, for example, all that whole list, those behave like theory predicted they would. Our hypothesis, which goes back to 85, a paper we published in Journal of Physics G, is that no, their metals should catalyze, that is, uh, enhance nuclear fusion. Some metals will do better than others. I realize you're not too excited about that. Maybe you are. I'm excited about this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Finally confirmed after nine years. Like we, it's been five years since 9-11. I'm sorry I was late getting started, but we'll, we'll get this uh, problem solved. Okay, now, so what is the scientific method? Alex asked me that. And I thought this is a good thing to go through because some of us need a little refresher. We've seen it in school, most of us. But, you know, we get all these ideas, and some of them, you know, uh, I realized the, okay, the question, did planes hit the towers or not? That's, that's the one that's kind of divisive. And also, you know, what hit the Pentagon? That can be divisive, too. I've noticed that. Okay, so how do we proceed to, get, to sort out fact from fiction? First, in science, we gather observations. We look at the data. We make some hypothesis. It's okay to speculate. That's the next step, really. The third step is crucial, and this is the key to the modern scientific method. We perform experiments to test our hypothesis. Okay? And that generates data. Now your guesses can't just be all over the place. You know, it, you, you're, you're stuck. You have to Make sure your hypothesis fits the data. And very often this requires a refinement of your hypothesis and more experiments. So that iteration goes on some right there, doing experiments, refining your hypothesis. And finally you publish in a peer-reviewed journal. Now that step has been in place since the time of Isaac Newton and was worked out by the scientists as a way of uh, putting discipline in investigations okay so I mean for uh, let's see so I can count on mm, 
probably about 20 peer-reviewed publications now. I'll show you. Not, not quite that many available to us yet, but there's, anyway, I'll show you where you can find those. Th these are the ones that have been peer-reviewed, means uh, if I've got a PhD, then other PhDs have to review <laughs> my papers, basically, okay? And uh, so it's a peer. It's someone that knows about what you're talking about. Okay, and they review your paper. So my pa the paper that you have online that I wrote, it was reviewed, actually went through two peer review processes, and I don't think I'll go through the reasons why that happened, but uh, the last time it was reviewed by four PhDs, two of whom were physicists. That's peer review. And, and I'll tell you, my paper changed substantially what you see now on the internet from what was first there last November. And, and a large part of that change was because of this peer review process. It's a very, very good thing. And so if somebody says to you, well, uh, let's see, what's something they say? Uh, well, let me think. I'm trying to think of some off the wall. Mm, uh, I, without offending. <laughs> okay, you know, there's these missiles, maybe a shot from pods underneath the jet. Okay, that's a possibility. But there's nothing peer reviewed out there on that. And, and if someone writes up a paper, they submit it to our journal, that's great, we'll send it out to people to review. These guys then will say, oh wait, did you think about the bump on the, you know, it exists on the jet, reflections, uh, the fact that when aluminum hits a plane, it's going to tend to scatter and, and it could even catch on fire. I mean, you know, did you think about those, those things? And, you know, I'll give you an initial burst. You probably heard that, but that's just... So it comes to mind. So that the point is you get the you get the input. And so it's a filter. So you have these ideas and they to, in order to be published, you have to go through this uh, filter, which is like running the gauntlet. And uh, then you have peer reviewed papers. Okay. So here's the scientific method then generally is we start with the facts and we determine what conclusions can we withdraw from those facts. The unscientific method, we start with a conclusion and then we find facts to support it. And you laugh, but, but this happens all the time. And uh, that's, and so now you say, wait a minute. The, what, what is the, I, I put the, on the book there, Muslims did it, I put that there. <laughs> that's the, that's the foregone conclusion. You know, Muslims did it, we must attack Afghanistan and Iraq. That's the conclusion. Just find for facts to support it. This is called, I call it, putting on the blinders. We only look at facts that support the conclusion. This is bad science. Another example of extremely bad science is the steel shipped to Asia, uh, melted down and destroyed. So here we have this uh, ancient scientist. After years of relentless study, laborious research, and numeral calculations, I have ascertained that no two snowflakes, uh-oh, there's two snowflakes that are exactly alike. So what does he do? Right? He just destroys the evidence, right? Uh -huh. Now this is called pathological science. In fact, if you read down there at the bottom, uh, extremely pathological science to destroy evidence. So, but this is what they did. And we need to call them on that. That's extremely bad science. And I hope, you know, as we proceed now with scholarly studies, we must insist that no more data be destroyed. Okay, so you can ask then, when some idea comes along, has that idea passed peer review and been published? It brings discipline, you see, and helps sort out fact from fiction. That's one of the main things I wanted to talk about tonight. So we have the Journal of 9-11 Studies. There are five papers in there. We have the Hidden History of 9-11, 2001. Paul Zaremka, a professor. Uh, and this is in uh, Research in Political Economy. That just came out last month. It's available uh, in on, you know, paper form, book. And David Ray Griffin's book, this is the one that my paper will appear in. My paper is also published in Global Outlook which I appreciate, Ian, uh, publishing that. Uh, so that's available. Okay, now the question I get, are there any publications that support you or refute you? Structural engineers in the new civil engineer, as soon as the NIST report came out, jumped on this, they pointed out, as a, a well-respected, 
um, Civil Engineering Journal. World Trade Center disaster investigators at NIST are refusing to show computer visualizations of the collapse of the towers despite calls from leading structural and fire engineers. This is a, a serious uh, rebuke or complaint, you see, against the NIST report. <clears throat> Three down here, NIST should really show the visualizations. This is University of Manchester Professor of Structural Engineering, Colin Bailey. Otherwise, the opportunity to correlate back to the video evidence and identify errors in the modeling will be lost. Well, they just refused to do that. A leading US structural engineer, not named, said the software used by NIST Remember, all they had finally was a software model because the real models didn't fail, you know. <laughs> Please keep that one in mind. That's a good one. You know, when you're on the radio, yeah, well, they, they built models, you know, and when they subjected them to extreme fire conditions, these are World Trade Center tower models, you know, floor assemblies, they did not fail in actual fire tests. So yeah, th those are experiments. That's solid data. And that's, that. by the way, pointing that out is what got Kevin Ryan fired, you know, by, he said, wait a minute, these are actual experiments, you know. All right. And, th and these guys, these engineers here are complaining about the, the lack of routine visualizations which are done with the finite element modeling that NIST did. So, FEMA report likewise, I, I just, look at the, in the middle there, Respect to error at the start. Respected members of the fire protection engineering community, community are beginning to raise red flags. The structural damage from the planes and the explosive ignition of jet fuel in themselves were not enough to bring down the towers. Fire engineering has good reason to believe that the official investigation blessed by FEMA is a half-baked farce. That, has, that may already have been commandeered by political forces whose primary interests, to put it mildly, lie uh, far afield of full disclosure. Now, th those are not just mild, you know, complaints. <laughs> those are, you know, calling a report a half-baked farce is as strong a language <laughs> as I've ever seen. You see? I, I mean, it's not like I'm alone in this. This is not crazy to challenge the official story. Okay, now here's something I'm sh quite sure you haven't seen before. This is published in a newspaper, a Provo where I live, Daily Herald. A letter to the editor by uh, uh, Alan Furmage. I mean, he signed his name. He's an emeritus professor, civil engineer. And, uh, or, you know, he's retired. He says, I feel obligated to reply to his conspiracy theory. He's talking about my uh, report. And on yellow, the structural design of the towers was unique in that the supporting steel and structure, uh, supporting steel structure, consisted of closely spaced columns in the walls of all four sides, just the sides. The resulting structure was similar to a tube. And then his argument is based on that. Now, folks, this is just wrong. Look at the photos. <laughs> You've seen them. <laughs> Is this a hollow? Okay, yes, there are 240 perimeter columns. It's fair to say that's like a tube. But what the heck is that in the middle? <laughs> you know, those 47 core columns, and that's been the nemesis for these official explanations for, since day one. And, and it's what Gordon Ross says, you know, where, where the big block hits that, man, it's going to give, but it's not going to collapse. Right. Yeah? It's strong, it's cool below there, huh? This is very important to realize this is not just a tube. Now, I got this. You know, early on, as engineer, another structural engineer at BYU came over to my office. He said, well, look, Steve, you've got to understand the, these, these towers were unique. They're like tubes. And, and I'm saying, no, I don't. He said, yeah, let me give you an example. He said, uh, you take a pop can, he said, and you stand on it. And then when you have somebody just tap it, the thing will, because you're standing on it, it will just collapse. And, I, and my thought was, well, what if you put... Um, let me think, how can I explain this? Uh, a railroad spike in the middle of that thing, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's not a hollow tube. 
And that, you see, but this is where they get this idea, and you have to, have you seen that, Chris? Hollow tube? Yeah, you talk. It's not a hollow tube. <laughs> so you have to start with some very fundamental facts. And I mean, if you tried to publish this in a peer reviewed journal, I, I hope the reviewers would say, well, you know, I've seen the pictures. They're in, these are straight out of my paper, by the way, these two photos. And others have shown them today. And then he goes on. I won't go into this. But again, notice he talks about a, a conspiracy theory, the start and finish, you know which is kind of an ad hominem way of saying, don't even look at this, I suppose. Okay. Okay, what data finally convinced you that 9-11 was not just by 19 hijackers? You know, the final convincing was this molten metal that I learned about. And so here's a picture. It takes a minute to come up, but this one has been stabilized and shows the, oh, he didn't change the word. It's not steel. <laughs> at least not mostly, it's mostly iron, I'm confident, as I'll explain. But you see that yellow hot molten metal in abundance pouring out of the South Tower just minutes before its collapse. And as you get to see where, when it actually collapses, it fails at the same spot. I mean, it twists and buckles at the same spot. So this molten metal is a very significant event in the, uh, in the history. Oh, look at the white smoke coming off, did you see that, that ash? That uh, is uh, totally consistent, again, with thermite, the yellow to white hot molten metal. And as the metal splashes against the cement, uh, the columns there, you see the white interior. I mean, it's extremely hot, this molten metal. Here's a picture. It's mentioned in an appendix, a NIST report. Um, I'm going to start talking about thermite. And I'm, I'm using the term thermite generally. If you add sulfur and some other goodies, yeah, that's thermate. But I'm just going to, it's the thermite class. And so I'm just going to use the term thermite for thermite class. Uh, the technical word is aluminothermics. So that's a mouthful. I'll just say thermite <laughs> class uh, reactions. But characteristic of thermite burning is this unusual flame. It's, it's actually a reaction. It's white. You see it there? in the middle, uh, between the 80 and the 83, right between there, that white hot um, reaction region, and then again, the white dust coming off. Well, that's just what you expect with thermite reactions. Pa pardon? How long before the collapse did it get It's about four minutes it starts, and then it continues for, for several minutes. I mean, this is a lot of molten material, thanks. Uh, not just a cutting, t uh, I'll, yeah, but it's, it's pouring out of there, yeah, okay. So the plume of uh, smoke uh, that comes off now is this white ash. Let's, uh, NIST says that this co is consistent with it being molten aluminum. But the first, when I first saw that, I had worked with molten aluminum previously, and molten aluminum at all temperatures, I mean up to when the pot, which is steel, is yellow hot, you pour out the aluminum, the aluminum still looks silvery. And I'm getting ahead of myself a little. We'll show you those photos. But it doesn't look yellow hot, aluminum, when it's uh, pouring in daylight conditions. I'll skip that one. Dr. Pitts said uh, it's probably, okay, molten aluminum from the plane. Somehow got across the floor, you know, some distance away, flowed and somehow got up to yellow hot. Now, aluminum melts at a temperature which would be red hot temperature. It melts about 600 centigrade. And so, but yellow hot is around uh, 1,100 centigrade. <laughs> and so, you know, how do you get it up hotter? And even if you do get it hotter, it still looks silvery. I mean, this notion that this could be aluminum from the plane is just really not going to pass peer review. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, but anyway, to check things, we do experiments. That's a hypothesis. Could be molten aluminum. We check it with an experiment. We poured the aluminum. It stayed silvery, straw gray at all temperatures. But the molten metal from the WTC was clearly yellow to white hot, and it thus could not be molten aluminum. We then uh, did some other things. Uh, there's a fellow Dr. Greening said, well, maybe aluminum, molten aluminum, when you put that on rusty steel, you'll get a kind of a thermite reaction. We tried it. We did not get those 
highly exothermic reactions. And I have a paper, which I hope to get into the Journal of 9-11 Studies. It'd be easier for you to find. <laughs> but it hasn't gone through peer review. I, I need to repair. See, when you go through peer review, I expect I've got to have that mm, well-worded, carefully done, you know, that's where we sort out fact from fiction is through peer review. Okay, so here's this cup now, um, steel, which we heated to orange yellow hot, as you can, I think, see in the picture. And then as we poured the molten aluminum out, the aluminum still looks silvery. Okay, thermite, aluminum powder plus iron oxide, which gives you the aluminum oxide, which is the white plume, and molten iron. Now let me, so here's a little more detail on that. I threw this in at the last. Thermite type reactions. You always have aluminum powder. And if it's, if it's just finely divided, you get incendiary. The incendiary. This means it, uh, bur it, it reacts slowly and it can cause fire and it can melt through structural steel, but it, it's slow. There's no explosion heard with an incendiary because there's no explosion. It's slower than that. Now, on the other hand, if you go to ultrafine aluminum powder, there's a little chemistry here. It's very important, though. Uh, then, and also ultrafine uh, the metal oxide on the other side, iron oxide typically used. I list some other oxides. Anyway, then it will explode. So th thermite, again, you know, there's this whole range of materials you can add into the uh, thermite, I've listed in there. And then the fineness of the powder determines whether it burns slowly as an incendiary or immediately and as an explosion. You can do it both ways, okay? Thermite is extremely versatile. And I would add that um, there are no tagants. Now, the word, uh, I'll come back on tagants. But in, in conventional explosives like uh, TNT, uh, RDX, HMX, there's a, a tag, a chemical tag. So when the explosive goes off, the tag survives. Investigators can come and look and they say, oh, this has got some, you know, this tag in it. Tagant is the term they formally use. And now we can determine where this explosive was purchased and blah, we catch the guy. But with uh, thermite, there are no tags. <laughs> very clever, very clever stuff. Aha. Okay. I look at all the oxides you can use too, very versatile. I mean, you can mix it up and make it do all sorts of things. Okay, so we did experiments with thermite. On the right, you see this uh, there at BYU. And this was actually my daughter, bless her heart, got me going on this. She did this for a science fair project. I want to do thermite, you know. <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> Shelly, yeah. And so, you know, here we are. And I see the white ash coming off. It's really quite, quite dramatic. Now this, she, she had a stopwatch and uh, she said, okay, we'll time how long it takes for the thermite to, to slice through the steel cup that we had it in. And so, you know, we tried timing it. But you know what? what with so, we added sulfur. We just went to that reaction first. So it was really thermate. And phew, it was through it. And let, I mean, you couldn't even, you, you, it was just through. And there's this white hot molten iron dripping out the bottom of the steel cup within just a fraction of a second. We couldn't time it. It cuts so fast. And of course, thicker steel, it will take lo a little bit longer. Sure, could take uh, a few seconds. <laughs> well, I mean, you can actually time it. <laughs> okay. So we compare this molten metal, this white to yellow hot molten metal, with our experiments and the white ash drifting off and Gosh, they look very much the same. Now that was the condition. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, we've done more experiments now on this. I mean, it's just, every, it's like Alex was saying, as you get more data, it just keeps adding and adding, leading to the same conclusion. Thermite was deliberately planted in these buildings. I mean, that's the conclusion we're, we're tending towards. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm just going to mention this as it comes to mind. So there's another professor at BYU, uh, uh, Professor Campbell, young, bright, uh, very clever physicist. And he had heard I was doing these experiments, and I'll show you the data in a minute. Uh, you know, we've actually analyzed now the, 
the composition using an electron microprobe and other methods. But anyway, he says, well, how's it going? And I said, well, you know, it's mostly iron. It's not, there's little aluminum, but it's not much. He says, ah, oh, so it's not, you know, molten aluminum. I said, yeah. And then he said, well, what else you got in there? Well, there's very little chromium. Ah, he says, there's not, it's not the structural steel that melted. You know, it's, it's, it's looking like thermite, isn't it? Yeah, what else you got in there? <laughs> I, said, I said, it's got sulfur in it. He said, well, what does that do? He didn't know. So I said, well, when you put sulfur in, now when that molten iron hits the structural steel, it, it makes the steel melt much faster because it forms a eutectic. Oh, yeah, eutectic. Of course, it'll just slice right through that stuff. And he says, that's exciting. You're, you're getting results. We're finding out. And he said, oh, but that means... And he said, <laughs> you know, and he did. He reacted just like that. And he said, and he said, well, I'm excited for your results, but I'm sad for our country. Is what he said. He's a good man. And, and that was true too. That's what he. Okay, so you've looked at that, and uh, now here's a question that gets raised. So the question is, was thermite used in the cleanup? See, this is a legitimate question. So I asked Robert Moore, who's one of our scholars, and he has looked at hundreds, probably thousands of photographs. And he says, I've seen no evidence for the use of thermite by rescue workers or the cleanup crew. Much of their work has been pho photographed and is widely available. Why would they create hot spots around other more significant hot spots? As you know, there's these, this molten metal most of you know that. I'll show some more on that. Um, in fact, you see it here already. The, whoop, 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 whoop. the this yellow hot stuff uh, before cleanup began, and uh, Sarah Atlas saying the molten metal. She thought it was steel, and by the way, Loazo thought it was steel too. But no, we've now analyzed it. Uh, this is molten metal, primarily iron. There's some component of steel when you slice through steel, but not much. Huh? Anyway, this molten metal flowed in the pile of ruins, still settling beneath our feet. This is one of the very first responders that got there. And you see this molten stuff kind of settling in the pile. They used a lot of thermite, looks to me like. Anyway, why would they use thermite to, in a cleanup? This would be pretty crazy. It's extremely dangerous stuff, uh, very hot. I bet, but somebody raised it. It's just an example of one of these, I call it off the wall ideas. Somebody said, whoa, maybe they use thermite in the cleanup. Well, these enormous pools, you know, <laughs> we see the metal flowing out of the building, even in cleanup, that's not going to explain that, and, and so on. Now, they did use oxyacetylene torches, this is part of our answer. Thermal lances also could have been used, and probably where we're trying to pin that down. Michael Berger, a friend of mine, is uh, looking into that with one of the workers there. Just so you know, a thermal lance, this I learn when I answer these questions, so I don't mind them um, totally, even if they're off the wall. <laughs> A thermal lance or thermic lance or burning bar, this is out of Wikipedia, is a tool which burns iron in an oxygen environment. Now this is not therm thermite or thermate at all. It's burning iron literally in an oxygen. So you have, oh you see the tube that guy's got? He's got oxygen flowing up the tube and you're actually burning a metal, iron generally. And uh, that will allow you to cut through structural steel too. This however will not be confused with Thermite, the residue is, is not like thermite. Of course, um, this would not be a, any confusion to us. Okay, let's go on. There's one of these big chunks of previously molten metal. Huge quantities of the stuff. And here's another one you probably haven't seen. Um, I wish we had more photos with detail, but you see this flowing material. It's kind of brassy looking in this uh, view. <clears throat> found at ground zero. <clears throat> Enormous quantities of this. This is how it's been since day one. Oh, it's unbelievable. And this is six weeks later, almost six weeks later. And as we get closer to the center of this, it gets hotter and hotter. It's probably 1,500 degrees. We've had some small windows into um, what we thought was a core at some point, and it looked like a, uh, an oven. You know, it was just roaring inside. And it's just a bright, bright reddish orange color. See that stuff he's pulling out? What was that, Chief? You're gonna hold, we're going to hold off on the water. See the stuff he's pulling out? Yeah. It's red hot. If we hit it too much steam, you won't be able to see okay. what he's doing. Great. Yeah, and so you see, even weeks later, 
<clears throat> this metal as it's being pulled out. There's this uh, red, orange, hot metal still being pulled out. Uh, enormous pools under both towers and Building 7. Remember, Building 7 wasn't hit by a plane. And uh, here's a photo of a chunk of this material from the south tower, about a 40-pound chunk. It's about 9 inches square and about uh, 3 or 4 inches deep. <clears throat> and we have uh, now a small sample brought to BYU for analysis, but I'm going to keep you on pins and needles just for a minute. I want to answer another question, <clears throat> which actually relates to this. <laughs> have you received any threats or bribes? Well, you be the judge. Here's what the guy says. There was a mechanical engineer. As soon as my paper came out, wrote to me and, and BYU administrators and uh, engineers. He says, I'm quoting now from his email to, remember, not just me, but BYU administrator. The publication of this article can be stopped. I have the contacts to make this happen if necessary. I prefer to give you opportunity, speaking to me, to consider the consequences. You need to give this very serious consideration. This is an issue that is more important than any individual career. I think he was referring to my career. I'm very <laughs> sure he was talking about that. <laughs> Now, we had some give and take on scientific issues, which I welcome. And uh, <clears throat> he admitted, uh, as you see, we've talked about the squibs coming off. He said the North Tower squibs are interesting, are more interesting, and deserve more attention. They're quite similar to the material ejected at the Southwark Towers. If I can get this thing to show it again. Here's the Southwark Tower collapse. Watch the squibs, and you'll see, indeed, it's reminiscent of the, uh, of the North Tower. See, squibs coming off the, the center of the columns, and down they go. <clears throat> so he says, yeah, I admit, you know, uh, something, but, you know, so, but then, December, I regret that you're still trying to publish your paper. <clears throat> In other words, shut up <laughs> and get it off. There was enormous pressure for me to pull my paper off the internet for about a month. And this, is, this guy was a large part of the, that. The fact that a paper passed as peer review, which mine had been, and as accepted for publication, which mine had been, should not be viewed as validation of ideas unless the peer reviewers are really qualified to perform the peer review. He's challenging the peer review. And some of you have noticed that uh, <clears throat> uh, BYU Physics Department for just a few days, the Engineering Department for about three months, had statements challenging whether the peer review on my paper had been done correctly. And, and I believe that he influenced that. Um, I have learned to appreciate the value of science, silence. Again, I interpret that as meaning shut up. <laughs> even, look at this, even in the case of superior data and information. That's amazing. You still want to be quiet about it. Wow. In contrast to studying things that could cause harm in some unexplained way, the whole, well, he had some comments, but uh, the whole focus could be changed. And he goes through an idea here uh, about what, uh, something that could be researched. It's kind of clever, really. Uh, a low-velocity rocket fired from a helicopter to disperse fire ret retardants on a floor. Um, you know, study this out, and guess what? I would be happy to ta contact the head, Tom Hunter, and the head of Homeland Security to see if funding for BYU could, could be found for research, to research options for this purpose. His name, you know, I've, I've been asked that. And let me tell you something. If I tell Alex his name, if this guy, look, recently, ever since, you know, when I started talking about thermite, I reported at a, meeting of the Utah Academy of Sciences, Arts and Letters. Okay, my, the, my work on, um, so that was a formal scientific meeting. And that's why I feel, by the way, that information is public and I can now share it. You see, that's kind of the rule in science. First, uh, at a scientific meeting, then you can go public. Anyway, at that conference, uh, there was a reporter from Deseret News. She reported on my findings about thermite, which I'm discussing now. And that was in the newspaper. And it actually, it's quite a nice article, you know. The thermite, and no tagants in thermite. She put that in there. He wrote just like that. 
and he said, Jones should not be talking about thermite. And because it might tell terrorists something they don't already know. Now look, thermite, <laughs> that was his excuse. And he says, again, I can get this stopped. And, and he threatened action. Now, I, he didn't say legal action, but I assume that's what he meant. But he hasn't followed through. But, you know, so, <clears throat> yeah, he, so I learned something from that. They don't like things, they being he, but I'm extending that a little bit. They don't like things in the media. That makes me want to get things in the media. And they don't like, right? <laughs> and, and, yeah, so, I mean, I'm not totally, look, the, and the other thing they don't like is a discussion about thermite. So guess what? I'm going to talk about thermite every chance I get. <laughs> now, if he comes through with some legal action or such, you know, I mean, he's trying to get me to shut up here. And again, notice um, this grant. And he mentioned this in his, his most recent one, too. You know, we could, we could get you a grant. He mentions this now to a number of people at BYU. We could get Jones, and why would he do that? I mean, he's trying to get me to shut up. He says, you know, it's ridiculous. But he says, but we can still get you a grant. And notice at the bottom, naturally you're most likely to achieve the greatest success in such an effort, in other words, getting this money from Homeland Security, if you change course rather than continue to pursue your present effort. Name, name I will reveal if he does anything else that's... Uh, and then, and I'll tell Alex, he'll broadcast the name. He'll get thousands of emails. That's, that's my little in my pocket secret, you see, right? <laughs> and and, and if, if you're listening out there, Mr. Mechanical Engineer, he lives in the Bay Area, as I, as I understand, then you know I'm not exactly threatening, but I'm not responding to your threat favorably. Uh, I will disclose your name, and I don't want your money from Homeland Security either. Thanks. Then. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, now, <clears throat> look, so you see what was going on at BYU. We're getting a lot of pressure. Now, the question arises frequently, has, the, has BYU muzzled you? Somebody, Greg, somebody said yes, but the answer really is no. This guy, this outsider, made arguments to have my paper withdrawn, as you've seen some of them, and there were some others. But BYU, uh, in particular my dean, supported my right to publish and said, look, this is academic freedom. <clears throat> this question about peer review was settled. And the way that was done actually my paper went to another publication, David Griffin's, and it, was, it went through another set of peer reviews, this time by four PhDs, and that settled the question. The college dean did suggest to me that he personally would not give media interviews, and I, I, I went with that for a while. You may have noticed I wasn't giving, but recently, since this guy, this uh, outsider, this mechanical engineer, has you know, told me to not talk about thermite, I've decided I will give media interviews. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, now now the latest results, which I would call compelling. And, but remember, these aren't yet published in a peer-reviewed journal, so I, I have to be a bit cautious as a scientist. And here we're back to this material, previously molten metal. Here's the data which uh, very few have seen now outside of BYU. And this is what that uh, Professor Campbell was reacting to. On the left, uh, we see abundant iron. Now the white means there's a lot of this metal. And the dark regions are where there is less of it. This is what you expect from a, a melt with other stuff in there. You expect regions of high concentration, which is the white bands, and then low concentration, which is the dark. And then on the right, you see aluminum, but it's definitely there, but in spots. It's not mostly aluminum, it's mostly iron. We can strictly rule out molten aluminum from the planes in this material. It's a big chunk, remember, from the South Tower. Secondly, we see, and there's iron again, upper left. On the right is chromium. 
on the, and what that is is just noise. There's no pattern. There, uh, this is just uh, background noise. In other words, there's very little chromium. Now, steel has a fair amount of chromium in it. We're confident that we can rule out molten structural steel, but we don't make that statement conclusively yet until we do some more checking. On the other hand, there's a great deal of manganese, but notice it, cor it anti-correlates. In other words, where there's less iron, I don't know, I, I do have a pointer, but two screens, <coughs> let's just try it over here. So the white regions, more iron, huh? but then there's less manganese. And when there's less iron, dark regions, there's more manganese. That's an anti-correlation, which suggests that the manganese is not from, the, uh, not from steel. It's from something else. Now, potassium permanganate, which has manganese in it, is commonly used in ther therm uh, thermites, aluminothermics. Here we see aluminum, upper left, Potassium, again, potassium permanganate, you'd expect potassium, and sulfur in spots. So we see all of those. Most of the sulfur you would expect to be burned off, by the way, but there's still some there. And as Jim Fetzer mentioned, it's in my paper too. Another group, and this is in FEMA Appendix C, you won't find it in the NIST report, which comes later, but for some reason they just don't mention it. This is uh, that sulfidation, in other words, sulfur attacking steel at high temperatures was found by uh, Professor Barnett and Sisson. There's a little group there, Massachusetts, good work. Evidence of severe high temperature corrosion attack on the steel, including oxidation, we do see oxygen, and sulfidation, we do see sulfur, with subsequent intergranular melting. This is uh, Sulfur makes it melt at lower temperatures. Boom, it slices right through. Was readily visible, they report. And this is completely consistent with our observation and becomes a second corroboration, which in science now becomes compelling, if not conclusive. We're somewhere between compelling and conclusive. <laughs> now, I'll share with you some other, there's some other elements which I'm not gonna share because uh, I just want to check them out first, but manganese in abundance, and lower right, you see the fluorine. Now, where in the heck does fluorine come from? That's unusual to have fluorine. Chlorine, yes, but fluorine, where does that come from? Well, in um, thermites, fluorine is present in an oxidizer, which you, we can all read this, a polytetrafluoroethylene. <laughs> okay, the fluoro in there is fluorine. And the potassium, manganese, and fluorine are often present then in the residue. Have you checked other samples? Yes. Um, this sample clinging to this structure. And by the way, this is one of the things I think that was uh, overlooked by these fellows that destroyed the structural steel. They allowed steel to be put into monuments all over the place. There's dozens of these. and. There is this molten, previously molten material clinging to these structures. <laughs> yeah. I consider that it's, I mean, those are there, they're out in the public. So this uh, brave woman, again, you know, I'm not going to tell her name right now, but uh, she, let's see if I can, anyway, she got a sample. Her husband actually put the, the monument together, he was a welder, and she saw this stuff clinging to it and she said well it's going to be out in the weather that stuff might get washed off or whatever she gathered that off and put it in a bucket when she heard about my paper online she sent me this bucket of stuff and it's got all this molten metal in there <laughs> oh man isn't that something and that's the way that's the way we're proceeding but we know where this came from you know the provenience is clear from the world trade center and this stuff has in it iron sulfur again Potassium, manganese, calcium. These are uh, some of the, uh, was it arson using thermite? Well, these are some of the characteristics of thermite. This is a way to cut through steel of substantial thickness. An invention goes back to 99 using thermite. This quoting, you know, invention uses thermite. Cut through thick stuff, substantial. These are super, super thermite. Remember what that is? Real fine thermite, so it's explosive. And this, you put electric current through this a match. It's called 
an electric match, you put an electric current through the wire, the super thermite's out here, and that will touch off then the thermite or super thermite. If you want an explosion, use super thermite. If you want it to cut without an explosion, like in the South Tower, <laughs> you use uh, regular thermite. Ah, it's clear. Oh boy, there's so much we can talk about. Um, I'm going to have to skip some of this, though. Research by, look, I think this is neat, though. Chicago meeting, Kevin, he said I could talk about this briefly. <clears throat> Sol gels, these uh, uh, gels that are used to hold the aluminum particles and the iron oxide. And these materials now can be cast. <clears throat> and so you can cast this stuff. Now it's explosive. You put it right on the steel, man, touch that off you know, radio control to a super thermite match. Touch that off, man. It just, I mean, we're figuring this out, how this could be done uh, easily. And then we're seeing traces of this. But, but wait, with this stuff, uh, this sol gel leaves this trace. This residue is, is not always there, but it, it would certainly be uh, consistent with the use of these sol gels. And so guess what? A little drum roll. This is an important one. Okay, here it comes. One molecule is quoting now from a newspaper article, EPA's Eric Schwartz. One molecule described by EPA's Eric Schwartz was present at levels, quote, that dwarfed all others. 1,3-diphenyl propane. You're going to hear more about this. We've never observed it in any sampling we've ever done, Schwartz said. Now, they've looked at a few burning buildings before. All right. They never saw 1,3-DPP before. Here it is, and it's characteristic of these uh, sol gels used with thermite. Folks, we are nailing this, I think. <laughs> you know that? <laughs> now, I have to throw in, since that's Kevin Ryan's work, he says, I'm still working on it. You know, I really want to nail it. But here's some more um, sent by a friend, uh, pictures at a memorial park. Notice the cut, my. Um, if this was cut by, look at that, big jags. This is what you expect with thermite, holes in regions and this molten slag. See, we want to get some of that stuff and analyze it. We, we now have two different sources, but here's, here's another one. Here's another one. Now, <clears throat> this, see that molten slag on this structural steel? Yeah, get it quick. I agree with you. <laughs> and that's why I'm not saying where it's from. And I debated whether even to show these photos, but too late. <laughs> we'll skip that one. <laughs> I might get some... Uh, look, there, there are dozens, I think hundreds of these memorial parks around the world. So we have these photos. If mysteriously it disappears, that's more evidence, you know? So uh, anyway, we've got enough uh, probably... But I still like more. Okay. Can you prove arson with thermite? I'm quoting now from uh, Materials Engineering, uh, MEI, what is it? It's, it's some group that does uh, this uh, study of thermite arson. This gives me hope. They say, in recent years, the use of thermite reactions as incendiary, what's that? Fires burn slowly and so on. Okay. As incendiary devices has gained popularity with arsonists because they are easily ignited, like with the super thermite match. They burn quickly, in fact, as quick as you want, really, can generate a very intense heat in excess of 4,000 Fahrenheit. By the way, this was published before 9-11. <laughs> These substances are a mixture of copper oxide, of course you can use, I mentioned, iron oxide, molybdenum oxide, etc., potassium permanganate, other chemicals which can be homemade or purchased commercially, not, no tagants. Quoting out of the same article, when thermite reaction compounds are used to ignite a fire, they produce a characteristic burn pattern, which is white hot reaction region, white plume of aluminum oxide coming off, and then, yeah, the ash, and then the yellow molten metal, right, which later uh, solidifies. They leave behind evidence. Boy, do they ever. These compounds are rather unique in their chemical composition. They contain common elements, depending on what you use, copper, iron, calcium, silicon, of course, some aluminum always, but also more unusual elements, such as vanadium, titanium, tin, fluorine, and manganese. 
And we see some other unusual ones which for reasons you can imagine, I'm not gonna go into here in detail, but as we nail these, then I'll have them. We'll publish them. While some of these elements are consumed in the fire, many are also left behind in the residue, and that's what we're looking for. Now this is, this is uh, hope. MEI has conducted energy dispersive and spectroscopy. Minute traces is all you need, that little chunk I held up earlier today. I've got it here, but it's just a little piece of this molten stuff. Identifying the presence of these chemical al uh, elements. That's, we use that technique too. The results coupled with visual uh, evidence, which we reviewed just a minute ago, <laughs> flowing metal, white ash, etc., provide absolute certainty that thermite reaction compounds were present, indicating the fire was deliberately set and not of natural causes. In other words, <laughs> in, in other words, this really gives hope. You know, we're, we're not talking about holograms or something, which could be proven. We're talking about hard physical evidence. You know that we can analyze and, and nail this, and it has been done. So what's happening is turned into a, an arson investigation, is really what it is. Okay, let's see, time-wise, you guys are getting tired. Let me, let me slip ahead to some of the more interesting stuff. We wanna publish this, of course. Oh, scientific studies often motivate other investigations. Example, the blue dress, okay. There was a certain scientific evidence, hard evidence that came from that. And I think, I really do think that already right now, uh, <clears throat> the data are sufficiently compelling at this moment to motivate an immediate investigation of certain parties besides the 19 <laughs> hijackers, okay. Yeah. See, Jim addressed this chronicle of higher education. I just want to mention, this is an article that just came out, but I'm quoting this Jean Gravois. Look down at the bottom. What happens when science tries to function in a fringe crusade? In other words, this is what we are, I guess, to him, but, but heck, I was really disappointed, John. I, I showed him this evidence on Thermite, at least a good, he was there at the Chicago meeting. I have some new stuff, which I've shown you, of course, but anyway, he comes and just calls it a fringe crusade. Disappointed in this guy. So do I believe in fringe conspiracy theory? <laughs> okay, I'm quoting from Dick Cheney. To me, this is conspiracy theory. We saw on 9-11, 19 men hijack aircraft with airline tickets and box cutters and killed more than 3,000 Americans in a couple of hours. Now, if you believe that, that is a conspiracy theory with very little support behind it, in my opinion. And so, <clears throat> I, I will, I do, I renounce this conspiracy theory. How's that? I renounce this conspiracy. This, to me, uh, is conspiracy theory. Now, I want to mention a story real quick. One of my heroes from the past, uh, Polycarp, he's a bishop of the early Christian church and lived in Smyrna. Do you know about Polycarp? I see him nodding a little bit, but okay, he's a great guy. Let me tell you about him. So here's uh, this bishop. He's, uh, this was a time of empire that he lived in. Wouldn't that be awful to live in a time of empire? <laughs> and the Romans, as you know, were persecuting and killing the Christians. Now, he's the bishop of this congregation, so Roman uh, leader, soldier guy, uh, which I call him. I think he was uh, like a legionnaire, centurion, that's the word hauls him off, and they had this crowd of people gathered, Romans, persuasion, um, and they want to see this guy killed. And so he gives him a chance. He says, if you will denounce, this is a parallel now I'm drawing, if you will denounce Jesus Christ, I'll let you free. And Polycarp said, well, uh, you know, I'm an old man. He was about 80. He was about uh, 90 AD. And he said, as soon as I uh, learned of Jesus Christ, he became my friend and I will not renounce him. And so the Roman centurion said, well, I'll give you another chance. If you will denounce the atheists, I will set you free. And you see, to the Romans, the Christians were atheists because the Romans had their own gods. Huh? Their, we call it a myth now, but they called it their gods. Hmm? It was a very powerful myth in their society. Like 9-11? <laughs> okay. 
And uh, <clears throat> so what the centurion was doing, he said, I want you to renounce the Christians, you know, because they're atheists as far as I'm concerned. And, but here's what Polycarp did. He swept his hand across, he swept his hand across the Roman Empire people gathered there in the stadium. And he said, I denounce the atheists. I denounce the conspiracists. You see the parallel there? <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's the way I feel about it. That's the way I feel about it now. So I feel pretty strongly about it. <clears throat> and uh, I did write some words to this. Maybe we'll do that sometime. But I, uh, it's kind of, do you guys, who is, who is in Chicago? You wanna do it real quick? Do we have time? And then, and then I'll skip to the end. Okay, let's do it. Here's what you have to do to hear that. So we're going to sing words to that song. It's, it is fun. I like this. And I'll get you into it. And uh, every breath. OK. Now, this is uh, Dale Tippett singing now to this. He, he actually sings better than I do. <laughs> so we're going to sing along with Dale. And the words are kind of me that not not sure quoting uh, the fire. Silverstein. Yes, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Such terrible loss of life. Decided to pull it. Building seven came down. Here we go. It fell straight and fast. And not hit by our play. How do you explain the truth we'd like to know? Okay, now you gotta get into this now. The 9 11 Commission. Ignore the seven collapse. Say Iraq's to blame, it's our nation's shame. Was thermite used? And who said the fuse? Molten metal came down. It blew up pools underground. No air defenses that day.
appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, thanks. Now, uh, now look, I, I'm not quite done though, so <laughs> but that, I know you're probably right. But let, there's one more thing I want to go into if you can bear with me a little bit. So that was fun, wasn't it? And uh, I, you know, I. Um, yeah, somehow I'm sure we can, Alex, uh, work with him on that. We can get that. Yeah, what do you say? Go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you can, he was saying don't tell people about thermite, I mean you can buy the stuff on eBay, did you know, I mean it's not like it's a secret, uh, and, and obviously the, uh, the terrorists know about this stuff, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's go to about here. Okay, so we'll start with Ladine. Um, there's a lot of good stuff here. Ladine is one of the uh, uh, neocons. They call themselves neoconservatives, you know. They came out, well, there's some history. They came out, most of them were liberals and called themselves neocons now. Ladine is one of these, Michael Ladine. Has the ear of uh, Karl Rove. This is out of a BBC report. <clears throat> His view on the war on terror is clear. Ladine said, Iraq is just one battle in the larger war. Bringing down the regime in Iran is the central act. This is scary. You can see these guys are after it. You can see the plan, uh, you know. In his book, Ladine said, <clears throat> this is chilling to me, in order to achieve the most noble achievements, the leader may have to enter into evil. This is the chilling insight that has made Machiavelli so feared, admired, and challenging. I don't admire Machiavelli. <laughs> I believe in doing good, not murdering people for some. You know, it's ends justify the means. It's an old and very misleading philosophy. Richard Pearl, middle, we'll jump down there again, BBC. For justice and liberty to prevail in the world, force, he's talking about killing, sometimes has to be used. It's nice to sit around and say we're in Europe, we believe in the rule of law, we believe in the United Nations, but this is before Iraq, you know. But Saddam Hussein is there, he's a dictator, and he has weapons of misdestruction. And are you going to do something about it or not? You see these guys' philosophy and how much they influence our policy, these neoconservatives. Could it happen again, unfortunately? And that has been discussed, but here's a quote you may not have seen. This, by, believe it or not, is by uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. In the LA Times, April 13th, if there is another terrorist attack in the United States, you can bet your bottom dollar there will also be immediate charges that Iran, Iran was responsible in order to generate public hysteria in favor of military action. Well, I think he's right, but um, no, notice uh, what uh, earlier in this article, talk of a U.S. Stri strike in Iran, this is the title of the article, is eerily reminiscent of the run-up to the Iraq War. Yeah. Well, he knows what's going on. <laughs> he was opposed to attacking Iran, which is why he wrote this op-ed. Surely <laughs> they wouldn't lie to us. Uh, here I discuss the dust, and uh, people have talked about this earlier. This dust is very dangerous stuff. It was known to be so. The White House directed the EPA to add and delete information based on how it should be released. Uh, in other words, the scientist said this stuff is toxic, highly dangerous. That was reported to the EPA. EPA initially, let me back up, had uh, warnings. But at the White House's direction, now this is the National Security Council, the environmental EPA gave New Yorkers misleading assurances, these are also called lies, that there was no health risk from the debris-laden air. The White House convinced EPA to add reassuring statements and delete cautionary ones. That, that, that to me is already treasonous. You're, you're hurting your own. You're supposed to defend people against all enemies, right? <laughs> Domestic as well as foreign. Okay, so a lot of people are sick, unfortunately. About 15,000 BBC report in April of this year. And some have died. Is this truth? No. Is it caring for others? No. Long-term effect. 
you know, this business of willing to actually, it's human sacrifice if you think about it. What Alex mentioned, the Aztecs, you know, I mean, this is it's weird. Oh, I just threw this in at the last two. Do we torture detainees? See, President Bush said we don't torture prisoners. And just shortly after he said that, I heard that on the news, there is the general in charge of Abu Ghraib who said, well, we made a distinction between prisoners and extremists. You see? So when he says we don't torture prisoners, well, uh, we do torture. He didn't go to the next step, but we do make a distinction, and extremists don't have this guarantee. I've got to get myself one of those black hats. So I think they're cool. Okay, how do you feel? Let's see, not so good. Um, let's just read. The first National Security Council meeting is one of O'Neill's most startling revelations. From the very beginning, there was a conviction uh, that Saddam Hussein was a bad person, and that he needed to go. He says that going after Saddam Hussein was topic A 10 days after the inauguration. I eight swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States against all enemies. From the very first instance, it was about Iraq, it was about what we can do uh, to change this regime. Now, everybody else thought that grew out of 9 11. No. But this book says it was day one of this administration. Day one, these things were laid. Uh, and sealed. As Treasury Secretary, O'Neill was a permanent member of the National Security Council. He says in the book he was surprised at the meeting that questions such as why Saddam and why now were never asked. It's all about finding a way to do it. That was the tone of it. The President saying, go find me a way to do this. For me, uh, the notion of a uh, preemption that the U.S. has the unilateral right uh, to do whatever we decide to do is a, is a really huge leap. You're giving me the impression that you're just going to be stunned if they attack you for this book. Uh, and they're going to say, I predict, you know, it's sour grapes. He's getting back because he was fired. I, well, I, think I, will, I will be uh, really disappointed if they react that way because I think they'll be hard put But are you prepared point. for it? Well, I don't think I need to be because I, I can't imagine that I'm going to be attacked for telling the truth. Why would I be attacked for telling the truth? Mm. Uh, he was attacked, uh, yes. <laughs> In case you were wondering, it, isn't that, it's amazing. I mean, it's so many people. Obviously, the Constitution does not uh, justify uh, preemptive war. And oil, uh, you know, they talk, this is about the same book, which is uh, um, written by Susskind, who was on the tape there. Planning and vision, peacekeeping troops in Iraq, war crime tribunals, and even divvying up Iraq's oil wealth. So, you know, you, a lot of there's this big lie principle. We'll skip over that. Patrick Henry. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty, which we are engaged in? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth and to know it now. Yeah. Okay, da, 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 skip all this good stuff. <laughs> and the Constitution. I've already talked about preparing for the worst. I just want to remind you again. It's something a lot of people in Utah are doing <laughs> for various reasons. But water, food, just, you know, 500 pounds of grain, wheat, oats, whatever you like, you can get that for about $200 right now or less. And that'll sustain you if you've got water and, you know, a few other things, salt and a few medications. But it'll sustain you for about a year, 500 pounds. Great. It's only $200, you know. And, by the way, you can cook it in a solar cooker if they... If they <laughs> okay. The, oh, the cooker, you have to... I'm not selling... I have a few left, but I'm giving those to, like the guys in Mali. I really don't want to sell them, but, but online it tells you how to make it. It's very easy, cardboard, aluminum foil, or even a windshield uh, reflector. You just cut it the way it, I say there. SolarCooking.org, Google on BYU. You'll get the paper. 
Okay, now finally, this is my last topic. Are there any precedents? And uh, of course, Alex's uh, video went through this, so I'll go through it quickly. 19, 1898, the Spanish-American War was started on the pretext that the U.S. battleship Maine was sunk by Spain. Later, after the war was over, it was determined that this was a coal fire in the uh, Maine that sunk it. <clears throat> William Randolph Hearst told his reporter, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. And you know, this is uh, interesting how the media promoted the war to make money. It, it's, just, it's just incredible. I, I'm sure that wouldn't happen today. No. But anyway, I assume they'll give us a chance to explain our side of this. Might end the war though, let's hope. Soon, but here's what happened back in 1898. Soon a rallying cry could be heard everywhere. Papers, streets, halls of Congress. Remember the main to hell with Spain. That was the cry. Hmm? Catchy, and that's what happened. We got into a war with Spain. The Mukden incident, Japan wanted to uh, get Manchuria's uh, resources, part of China. To have a pretext, the Japanese army blew up tracks of their own railway near Mukden, blamed the sabotage on Chinese soldiers. Oops, I, an I is missing. <laughs> soldiers. And of course, that is how they had the pretext for war. This was discovered after the war was over. Reichstag fire was covered by Alex, uh, started by the Germans in their own Reichstag building, the German parliament using incendiary fluids, by the way, that reminded me of thermite, <laughs> and touched off a massive blaze, and it was blamed on the com communists, and it was one of the ways in which Hitler uh, gained uh, power and took away the civil rights of the Germans. The Himmler operation, also we mentioned, blamed, it was uh, blamed on the Poles and was pretext for attacking Poland. That was found out after, and this, by the way, is part of World War II, you know, a huge war. And uh, this big lie that Poland had attacked Germany was the pretext for the Second World War, along with the Reichstag fire. Okay, do we see a pattern here? I'm sure we do. <laughs> so I, I decided to carry on with that. Remember the Maine to hell with Spain. Remember the Reichstag fire to hell with the commies. Remember the Mukden to hell with China. You see, there's a Remember the Polish attacks, to hell with Poland. Remember the Gulf of Tonkin, to hell with Vietnam. You, you, that was reviewed by uh, both, uh, uh, let's see, Webster and Alex. So, now we just fill in the blanks. Remember the false flag operation, to hell with the country blamed. You see, this is the pattern, <laughs> see? And remember 9-11, to hell with Afghanistan and Iraq. Remember. This part's still coming to hell with Iran. You see how that works? It's a, it's a, now this is nothing new, people. <laughs> this goes way back. And so people think it's awful, our country. Well, we have done it. We did it with Maine. We did it with the Gulf of Tonkin. And uh, you know, this uh, has got to stop. Now, there have been many false flag events in history. Remember, I wrote this before I saw Alex's <laughs> thing. But it's, we're thinking along the same lines. According to historians, and Alex, I checked, he agrees, never before in history has the truth about such events, false flag events, been brought up before the war ended. And this is our chance to make history, to bless our children and grandchildren. It does sound like Alex, but I assure you, this is completely independent. <laughs> I wrote this, you know. Okay. Now, I predict, in this case, that we will get the truth out during, this, during these wars. Not that we want to prolong these terrible wars, but we want to get at the truth. Now, this is my last slide coming up, and I'd like you to read it with me if you agree with the sentiment. This is kind of like a, uh, an affirmation or a prayer or a statement of purpose. And if you'll read it with me, we say, this time before the war is over, we will get the truth out. Thanks. <laughs> Okay.
Thank you.